All right. Welcome, everyone. This is our very last science of of 2023. This is going to be the science of venom and poison. So very different things, very different topics. Um, so my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the wildlife education specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And um, we will go ahead and get started here. I'm going to share my screen. All right, I'm just going to be letting people in too. So if it looks like I'm not paying attention, I, I swear I am just letting people in. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Like I mentioned, venom and poison are very different things. I'm sure um, all of us at some point have probably used them interchangeably. I've heard someone use them interchangeably. Um, they're definitely different, but what makes them different? So we're going to go ahead and cover that today and kind of talk about why animals are poisonous or why animals might be venomous and which animals are which and what that means and why do they use it. And then certain animals in Nebraska and in the world that are um, kind of famous, I guess, for either being poisonous and or venomous. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, if you've been on Science Of before, you understand that I want you to ask questions. I want you to put um, comments in the chat. Please go ahead and do that. Um, please keep them on topic and make sure that you are kind to everybody. Otherwise, we do have that right to remove you. And then also, I am by no means an expert in any of the things that I've talked about. Um, I am an expert in science communication. So I'm an educator. I have um, lots of experience in wildlife and working with animals and natural resources. Um, definitely not an expert level, but if you ask me a question that I don't understand or I don't know how to respond, I will find someone that can answer those questions for you and I will get back to you. So, all right. I really like science and that's why we're starting these. We started the science of series and I'm so glad that people like you watch it and we are able to continue that. So thank you. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into what this is. So when we talk about poisonous and venomous. I've heard a lot of people doing education programs before and just talking to people randomly. Um, I've heard poisonous snakes. I've heard um, venomous plants, which is not incorrect. Um, just the way sometimes they talk about those plants are, are incorrect. But um, we're going to be talking today about what this actually means and why um, when people say that they might be incorrect when they say something like a poisonous snake in Nebraska. So um, Let's go ahead and talk about this. And it's not just about snakes. This is going to be lots of things that are poisonous and or venomous. So when we say this, are they interchangeable? Are those two words interchangeable? They are absolutely not. Um, when I ask kids to talk about, or even adults, what's the difference between poisonous and venomous? Um, it's kind of hard for people to come up with an answer. They say a lot of things like, well, one's more potent than the other, or one can kill you and the other one can't. And um, it's really hard to find that definition of them. So um, when we talk about which is which and how do you know which one to use it, um, they both can be deadly. Um, poisonous animals or organisms or poisonous products, um, venomous animals, venomous organisms, same things. They can both be deadly. Um, there's a little saying. Uh, some people have used it like with all frogs or toads, but not, or all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. It's kind of the same thing. So all venoms are poisons, but not all poisons are venoms. And so if you're confused, that's okay. Um, so when I say mean the same thing, um, they don't mean the same thing, but the toxic chemical is produced naturally by the organism. So um, either they get it from that outside source and they manufacture it or they manufacture it within their body. So, um, but what's the difference between venomous and poisonous? So venomous is applied to organisms that will bite or sting to inject their toxin. So that has to be injected into the bloodstream. Um, poisonous is a little different because it applies to organisms that either you touch something, you inhale it, you breathe it in, or you eat them, and that means that they're going to be toxic. So if an animal eats a poisonous, um, an animal like this golden frog here, um, that would be poisonous. They have to eat it or injecting the venom. I always think of snakes just because um, venomous snakes have specialized fangs or teeth that are used to inject their toxin. So um, the difference really is the delivery of these toxins. All right. So what does this mean? So the fundamental difference, like I mentioned, is how those toxins enter the body. So the best like quote that I could find is if you bite it, 
and you die, it's poisonous. If it bites you and you die, that's venomous. So um, there's a lot of like cartoons and stuff going around that kind of talk about this, but venom is usually directly injected into the organism, whereas poison is more passively delivered, such as being touched or ingested. So um, it's a little bit different in how we talk about that. Um, that's why when a lot of people say animals are poisonous, but they're actually venomous or vice versa, it does mean something different and it can be really confusing. So talking about this terminology, what is a toxin? A toxin is any substance that's derived from an organism which has deleterious effects on another organism. So whether that be poisonous or venomous, um, that toxic toxin has an effect on another organism. Venom, like I mentioned, has to be bite or stinging. Um, so technically you could say a bee is venomous because they have a stinger. Some bees have stingers and they are able to inject that toxin or that venom into a person or into something that's a predator or something like that. Poison is a substance sometimes in very small amounts can cause serious impacts, but it has to be ingested, inhaled, or touched. Um, and then, like I mentioned, all venoms are poisons. All poisons are poisons are not venoms, though. All right. Um, so here's a little cartoon. If you're like the words that you're saying, I just don't understand. Here is a little cartoon. So poisonous. If you bite it and you have an effect on you, you die or an animal, something like that, you have to bite it. If it bites you, that means that it's venomous. So this is a really quick little um, uh, cartoon graphic that can kind of help put that into your mind. All right, so animals that are venomous or uh, poisonous, why do they have this? Is it a curse or is it could be a cure? So an estimated about 15% of animals or organisms in the animal kingdom are going to can be considered venomous. This is about 220,000-ish species when we talk about this. Um, and it is represented throughout the animal kingdom. It's not just snakes, it's mammals, it's birds, it's it, uh, arthropods, it's um, snakes, it's uh, spiders. Lots of different types of animals are shown to be venomous. It's not just a single group of animals. So um, normally animals that or organisms that are venomous, um, they have them for various purposes, such as either capturing their prey or getting a predator to leave them alone. Um, humans, it seems, have we've always just kind of been fascinated by these venomous animals. Um, it could be a fear. It could be just fascination in general. There's a lot that we still don't understand about animals that are poisonous or venomous. Um, however, there is a deeply rooted fear with a lot of people. I think that has a lot to do with like public media and the negative impacts that we hear about a lot of these animals. We don't necessarily all hear the good things that happen because of those animals. A lot of animals that an organism that our um, venomous or poisonous, they have those subject or those toxins for a reason. And a lot of people have been talking about, and this is not new research by any means, um, but there's a lot of scientific research that focuses on using those venoms and toxins for the benefits of people. So a lot of snakes, um, if anyone has diabetes, um, one of the animals, their venom actually has been used to linked to a diabetes medicine um, that helps people control their diabetes. So it's not all this horrible fear that we hear about. They're not just out to get people or out to eat other animals. Um, they have them for a reason and they've evolved this um, special adaptation for a reason. All right, so let's go ahead and hit on venom. Um, I do have way more information about venom. Poison was hard to find like good information on. So I have a little bit more on venomous animals uh, or organisms than I do on poisonous, but we will get to poisonous later on in the um, in the program here. So um, venomous animals, um, about 57.5% of animal lineages contain some type of venomous representation. So that's half, a little bit more than half of all all animal lineages have some type of um, representative that is venomous. So like I mentioned earlier, this could be birds or mammals or scorpions or spiders. Um, lots of different types of animals can be venomous. Um, scientists believe that venom, there's a little... It was hard to find an exact number, so I kind of just averaged from what I found, but people believe or scientists believe that venom overall has evolved about 19 lineages or even 29 different times. So it's evolved 29 different times in 19 different organisms or groups of organisms. Um, just thinking about this, when we think of all those animals out there that fly or different types of flight, um, scientists believe that flight has only evolved around four times um, throughout animal lineages 
lineages. So 29 times in venom, four times in flight. So that's kind of shows you how many different times um, having venom or some type of venom um, producing system has evolved over time. Um, so when we talk about this, the way that animals are able to envenomate their prey or predators, it comes in a wide range of categories. So the way that they have special um, parts of their body or the way that they do this or how much venom they produce or where they hold their venom. Um, there's a lot of different strategies um, as far as like anatomically and then also the application. So how do they deliver that venom? Uh, many organisms produce molecules in their venom that are very intricately complex. So um, there's special shapes as far as the cells and the molecules and the venom that lock them precisely into certain proteins on their own cells. So it's not just a oh man, you're venomous. You have a special complex cocktail of toxins in your body that are precisely um, arranged neatly in their molecule little form so that they are able to be delivered. All right. So where did venom actually come from or how did venom evolve over time? So um, when we talk about venomous animals, they are not closely related. So you're talking about animals like an octopus, a blue ring octopus, or this harpoon that I have on this photo here is from a cone snail. So yes, there's a snail that is venomous out there. So um, these animals are very, very um, not closely related. One of the only things they may have in common is that they do have some type of venom in their body. Um, so this means that venom has independently evolved many times throughout history. Um, scientists kind of compare um, the venom gene by gene um, to see how they're related to each other. So they're taking one gene from one animal, one gene from another animal, and they're comparing to see how those are comparable to each other and not necessarily the animals themselves. Um, each type of venom is encoded by a single gene and that venom requires a lot of equipment. So um, there's special glands that animals will have to have. How are they gonna get transported from the place where they make it to the place where it contacts their victim? So there's a lot of different things and equipment that animals need to have in order to be venomous. All right, um, so it didn't just pop up one day, it didn't just appear, um, but venom started out as genes for other functions. And so just like everything else, um, they were really closely related to other genes that carry out completely different jobs. And over time, they've just mutated. So some venoms were closely related to immune system proteins. Um, so there's very similar ones today. So ones that have actually bacteria that invades the body. Some people are a little, um, there's like a weird line of talking about like Komodo dragons, are they venomous? Are they, um, do they just have toxic saliva? What's the deal with that? So that would be something like they have some type of venom or toxicity in their bacteria that invades the body. It's not necessarily a venom, but it's something close to that. And then people think that that evolved from that. Um, uh, others are really closely related to like digestive enzymes. So a lot of scientists believe that snakes over time, the reason that they evolved to have venom is for actually digestive purposes and not necessarily predator deterrence or anything like that. So, um, so over time, how does an enzyme end up as venom? So there's a number of ways that this happens. Um, over time, the most common type of way is a mu mutation causes the DNA to get duplicated over time. Um, so duplication could mean that one animal, um, that mutated gene just produced twice as much venom as um, the original protein. So, um, and then that gene will get mutated. And again, without harming the function of the original protein, um, but that mutation, can change a single gene um, about where it should make the protein. So instead of normally making it in this part of the body, that gene has mutated over time so that the gene now produces the protein in this part of the body. So instead of becoming, um, let's say that enzyme was active in the pancreas, maybe this next time that the gene mutates, it's in the mouth. Um, so the enzyme could then um, get in to the wound of an animal. So let's say an animal had this enzyme in its mouth, it bit something, that enzyme or that protein ended up in the wound of the animal that it bit, and then it has a harmful effect. Um, so over time, this is favored by natural selection. And then this, um, over time, evolution has become more and more toxic. And then that is what produces venom. So um, kind of a long process, but it didn't just appear one day in some animal. And then all of a sudden, it, it uh, other animals started copying that other animal. Um, so when we break it down, 
what exactly is venom? So it's a long process and it's a very long definition, but there are these biochemical arsenals. They have a lot of different compounds in them. They could be salts, small molecules, proteins, peptides. All of these are referred to as toxins. So these toxic enzymes, um, they basically are various other proteins that act in different ways. Um, so they could be very, very extreme, um, like something that would affect the nervous system, or they could be a little less uh, minor, like something that would cause um, an inflammation in an animal. So um, there's a big difference between the potency of those uh, toxins, um, but the toxins will function individually or sometimes they will um, synergistically um, be together and they will target those essential compounds and they will mess up basically the psychological and the physiological signaling processes. And then um, that is what affects the animal. So um, over time, what will happen is that it will charge together or um, with something else um, or independently, and it will affect that animal over time. All right, so um, functional diversity, there's a lot of different reasons that animals have or have produced venom over time. They're not for the same reason. Um, so different species will use different uh, purposes of venom, but the primary function of venom in most organisms is to facilitate feeding. So it's either through prey incapacitation or by enabling some sort of ectoparasitism. So um, the animal is biting their food so that they can easily digest it and they can easily eat it um, and the prey doesn't get away. Um, so platypus males, for example, um, so platypus, we obviously don't have them in Nebraska, they're native to Australia. Um, they're one of the very, very few um, mammals that are considered venomous. So they have little spurs, um, kind of like a pheasant has a little spur on their leg. Um, but what they will do is they have venomous spurs on their hind legs and they will use those to compete with other males during mating season. So there's something different. It's not all just about getting their food. Um, for instance, scorpions, male scorpions, they inject small amounts of venom um, into the female's body during sexual encounters. Um, there's something called a tawny crazy ant, um, they use venom to actually neutralize venom of uh, fire ants. So fire ants will bite them and they use their venom to neutralize the uh, venom that's inside of them. So there's something different. Um, and then moles and shrews. So couple of European moles and our um, shrew in Nebraska actually is venomous, um, the short-tailed shrew. Um, they will use this to basically store their food. They leave it in a burrow and then they come back later and eat it. We'll talk about them later, but um, they can stay crunchy for a while. So that's one of the reasons that they use their venom. So very, a lot of different types of diversity about why animals actually have venom. And then with all those diversities about why animals have them, there's a lot of different ways that animals directly in inject um, the venom into whatever they're doing. So I won't go through this, but I just wanted to show you the sheer capacity and vastness of all the ways that animals have body parts that they use to envenomate something. So for instance, like spiders, centipedes, crustaceans, they have these modified fangs, um, like in a spider, their chelicerae or their fangs that they will use to bite and that injects venom into their prey. Um, snakes have modified teeth. Um, there's some fish out there that are considered venomous. They have spines that they will use. So if something gets too close to them, they prick, and then that venom will go into the animal. Um, there's spurs, like those monotremes, the platypus that I was talking about. Um, there's cone snails, like I showed you earlier, that have the harpoons. Um, there's a proboscis, there's ovipositors, stingers, beaks, all these different types of things. There's Over time, they've evolved different ways of injecting that venom um, in some way. All right, so here's a quick video. I just want to show you a different, couple different ways that animals will use. There's no sound, um, but this, uh, uh, sorry, I said snake. This, um, what is it called? A spider, sorry. The spider is actually eating a frog, um, but you can see their chelicerae, those really fuzzy, um, they almost look like uh, legs. Those are their fuzzy fangs. And you can see when the spider moved, um, it had that black little spur. It looked like a spur and that's their teeth. So that is the way that spiders, for instance, use their fangs to envenomate their prey. Um, everyone knows snakes. So here's one of the, you can kind of see the snake is swallowing its food. You can see as it moves its mouth, um, 
to get their food down their throat. You can see that they have special fangs or teeth that have evolved over time to um, inject their prey or inject their venom into their prey. So this is not a animal that we have in Nebraska, by the way, just wanna point that out. All right, and then this one is actually an invasive species that you can find um, even in Florida, um, but they're called lionfish. So um, few fish in Nebraska, or sorry, in the world have spines on them. So every single one of these little frills, um, that's why they get their name lionfish. Um, and on their back, they have barbs on them. So if an animal would try to eat them, they would poke themselves with the barbs. And that is a way that that food or that venom gets into their prey. Um, like I mentioned, these are actually invasive. Um, one of the things that people can do is they will give money to people if they bring these animals dead to certain, like a bounty hunter. Um, they're highly invasive, um, but they uh, will eat them. So there's people that actually eat these animals and it's totally fine. You won't get sick. You won't get hurt. Um, only if that poison or that uh, venom will touch the barb. So as long as you don't eat the barbs, you'll be completely fine. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, different types of venomous organisms. Um, so I tried to pick some ones in Nebraska just because that's where we are. Um, there's not a ton of them, but I did find some that we do have. Um, so one in Nebraska that we occasionally find, I don't want to like freak people out and say that they're everywhere, but people occasionally see black widow spiders. So um, these guys, uh, Everyone knows what a black widow looks like, but it's usually the females that people see. Um, this female right here in this picture right here, you can see there's an hourglass shape on the bottom of the abdomen. Um, that's how you know that it is a black widow. Um, but these ladies and guys will make um, sticky, silky, messy webs, um, but they do have that hourglass shape on the underside of the female's abdomen. The males are often eaten by the female in a lot of, like in a lot of spiders, um, but they're smaller, they're gray or brown in color, kind of indistinct. Um, but their venom is a combination of biologically active protein proteins, peptides, and proteases. Um, the primary toxin that's found in their venom is um, alpha latroctocin. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but there's a special type of venom that is in um, black widow spiders, and they have very toxic effects if the animal would try to eat them or if they get bit. Um, but the vertebrae, the central nervous system, basically it depolarizes the neurons. It affects the nervous system. Um, like in an animal, there would be pain or swelling, redness at the bite. Um, some people um, have been bitten by black widow spiders. Um, no one in Nebraska since the 60s, so we're good. Um, but they have had different types of people respond differently to certain types of venom. So um, some people have more of a serious response than other people. Um, I did see my first black widow spider this summer. I was super stoked about it. Um, it was in a prairie dog hole, actually. Um, and I just kind of popped inside. I was looking for rattlesnakes, but I um, looked down and I saw the super messy web and I saw the red hourglass and I was like, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a black widow spider. So um, they do occur in Nebraska. Um, this was kind of out kind of by Ogallala. Uh, so they do occur in Nebraska, um, but they are kind of neat to see. But again, a good animal to kind of give some space to. All right. So bees. So technically bees, um, wasps, hornets, yellow jackets, all those types of animals, um, they have some type of venom. So uh, most species of bees, they're very docile. Most of them are typically docile. Um, and then usually there's not really any problematic responses between bees and people, but every once in a while there is. I'm sure a lot of people have either been stung by a bee or they know someone that's been stung by a bee. Um, but when a bee stings, their apparatus consists of basically three functional parts. There's a motor part. Um, the motor part is composed of muscles, um, plates. Um, this is basically there's one on each side. And then the piercing part is composed of what's called two lancets and a stylet. So um, this is basically how that venom is moved through a tube and into the, the animal or the person or the prey or whatever. Um, and then there's the venom related part. Um, so the venom related part 
is composed of a venom sac. There's two venom glands and what's called a bulb. And then there's barbs that anchor the stinger into the skin where the stinger cannot be retracted when the bee escapes. So there are certain species of bees that will sting once. There's certain types of bees that can sting multiple times. But um, basically what happens is people tell you that if you get stung by a bee, try to get that stinger out using something like a debit or a credit card um, to make sure that that venom is not released anymore into your skin. Um, so about 90% of the venom sac content is delivered within the first 20 second, 20 seconds after being stung. So if you get stung by a bee, give it 20 seconds, 90% of the venom in that sac on the bee has been entered into your bloodstream. Um, again, it just the severity, depending on people, I've been stung by a wasp, didn't do anything. Um, some people have a huge allergic reaction. It's all determined by the age of the person, the body weight, how many times you've been stung, the individual characteristics of the victim. There's a lot of different things that can change um, depending on the person getting stung or the animal getting stung. Um, so bee venom is a big complex cocktail of compounds. It's proteins, peptides, phospholipids, um, pheromones. There's actually really high water content, um, but there's also certain things in there um, that are very similar to something like wasp venom. Um, so wasp venom contains sometimes adrenaline, dopamine, and histamines. Um, so pretty volatile compounds. And then seasonal changes have had an impact on the bee venom content. So um, depending on the season that you are stung, um, sometimes the uh, season affects the flowers and the fruits and therefore their feeding and how much they're eating and the certain types of things that they're eating and how that affects the types of venom and the compounds and the toxicity of their venom. So it's kind of interesting that what they're eating and the season can affect the different types of, ve of venom that they have. All right. Um, this is also wasp. So like, what's the difference between bee and let's say wasp venom? So anything really that hymenoptera, that hymenoptera, um, it's divided into subfamilies. So you have like the honeybees and the bumblebees, and then you have the vespids, which are like wasps, hornets, paper wasps. Um, basically it just depends on the reaction um, to these certain types of things. Um, but venoms are all different. So um, each Type contains a major allergen, which can be well-defined. Um, there's all these different types of um, cocktails in bee venom. There's something called an antigen 5, which is only found in wasp venom. Um, but both types of venom, bees and wasps, they contain something called a hyaluronidase. I'm not saying that right. Um, but basically patients allergic to wasp venom are rarely allergic to bee venom, which is interesting because they have different types of compounds. But then some people are only allergic to bees. Some people are only allergic to wasps. Um, a couple of years ago, my husband and I had a um, family group swarm of uh, wasps living between our brick and our siding. Um, we would see them fly in and out. So one day we went to take them out and um, I got stung in the hand and he got stung in the arm. Nothing happened. It hurt for me. And I was like, dang, that hurt. Um, he ended up having a blood infection, ended up going to the hospital, um, all because of a wasp thing. So it's very different between people. It all depends on the person. All right. So there's something, this one's in Nebraska, but I'm sure some of us have heard of these kind of um, potent caterpillars. So this is something called the American dagger moth. Um, they're usually kind of fuzzy. They're hairy. They have these, like, they look like something out of a cartoon. Um, but this is the American dagger moth caterpillar um, can break off and into the skin and sting people. It causes hives, burning sensations, sometimes just a general skin irritation. Again, depends on the person, um, but their body is covered in these really short tufts of yellow hair hairs and then they have longer wispy yellow hairs and then they have these really tall kind of black looking um, things that stick up. They're called lashes. Um, they extend and sometimes they can over be an inch long, but they are native to North America. They can be found in a variety of habitats, um, forests, residential areas. Um, just speaking in general, as far as caterpillars go, um, the general rule, and this is not applies to every caterpillar, but the general rule is that caterpillars um, can cause stings, um, and most of them are harmless, but there are a few venomous species, even in the United States, just that real general rule is if they're brightly colored, if they're fuzzy, if they have bristles on them, or their appearance is kind of just overall fuzzy and cute, good idea to just leave them alone. So some of the most cute looking caterpillars or the fuzzy looking caterpillars are the ones that people tell you to kind of stay away from. So it's just kind of a good general rule. If you don't know, don't touch it. 
All right. Um, catfish are one that in that family of fishes that we have in Nebraska. Um, so these guys, um, most catfish are considered venomous, um, but it's not what it's not like what you would think. I'm sure all of us have been like, I've caught a catfish. How did I not know it was venomous? Um, mostly what the danger is to people, it's not necessarily the barbs and the venom. It's the secondary bacterial and the fungal infections that can be entered through the wound once the caterpillar, once the catfish punctures you. Um, so the catfish skin toxin and the venom comes from their dorsal and their pectoral spines. So dorsal meaning on top, pectoral means like your pecs. So sometimes like they have some underneath um, but the stings are really like innocuous, um, but they can have severe necrosis on the tissue. It just depends on how like rough that sting was. Um, but there's a lot of different symptoms, again, depending on the person. Um, but uh it can be um, kind of hard for people sometimes. So basically when the catfish feels threatened, um, they lock their spines into place. And then when the spine jabs a potential predator, that membrane surrounding the venom gland cells is torn and it releases the venom into the wound. Um, so basically the venom can affect the nerves of the animal. It breaks down red blood cell cells. It causes severe pain. Um, it reduces your blood flow, muscle spasms, sometimes respiratory distress. Um, it just, again, Again, depends on the person and it depends on the species of catfish, but most of the dangers to people are from those secondary bacterial infections that you can get. So anytime that you're stung or punctured by a catfish, it's a great idea just to keep that wound clean, wash your hands, um, get all that kind of bacteria and stuff, especially being in a river or a lake. All right, so snakes are one. Um, when we talk about venomous snakes, there's two main groups. There's the viperidae or the vipers or the elapidae. So um, vipers are, we're talking in Nebraska, we have rattlesnakes, um, or sometimes people refer to those as the adders, which we do not have in Nebraska. Um, generally, they have different types of toxins. So not all snakes are considered toxic um, to the potency of others. So when people ask you, what's the most dangerous snake or what's the most venomous snake? Well, it depends. It's all subjective. So um, the vipers, the adders and the rattlesnakes, typically they have what's called a hematoxic venom. Um, this attacks your circ circulatory system and it has basically a severe decline on the body to clot. So your, your blood just won't clot. Um, the elapids or the elapidase, they are like your mambas, your cobras, your crates. They have what's called a neurotoxic venom, and that interferes with the transmission of nerve impulses. So they two, to, two totally different things. Um, but there's also lots of other toxins. There's cytotoxins. These cause damage to your cells or your fun function of your cells. Um, we talked about hemotoxins, we talked about neurotoxins, cardiotoxins disrupts the heart function. Um, but when we talk about classifying venom into one of these categories, it's often a bad idea and it's often wrong because they're not just one thing. Um, like we've been talking about, venoms are this really big complex cocktails of enzymes and um, they should not be put into one category. Um, most venoms, however, are dominantly either neurotoxic or hemotoxic, um, especially within those two groups, the viperidae or the elapidase. All right, so why do snakes have venom? Um, it's kind of a long story. We're not exactly sure why they have it, but most scientists believe and trust and theorize that the reason that snakes have venom is because they wanted to use it for digestion. So, um, but they also obviously use it to immobilize their prey. Um, there's different venoms for different prey, um, different strike strategies for the different types of prey. Um, as far as digestion goes, they have this cocktail of digestive enzymes we learned earlier that uh, venom kind of evolved over time from digestive proteins. And so um, it makes sense that they still use it today to digest their prey. Um, but venom process usually starts the digestion from the inside out. And then digestion time is reduced, which makes the animal be mobile sooner because if animals eat a large prey, they're kind of vulnerable until they digest that prey. So the faster that they can digest, the faster that they can get away and be mobile again. Also, when people talk about defense, they think that snakes clearly have venom for defense mechanisms. Absolutely, that's not incorrect, but venom is very expensive for the body to manufacture. So um, usually what happens is strikes with venom injection are kind of a last resort. Most snakes will move away, they'll rattle, they'll hiss at you, they'll let you know, leave me alone. Um, most of the time striking with venom injection is kind of their last resort, um, otherwise it's me or you. 
All right, so really quick, I just want to hit on snake bite statistics. Um, globally, we believe from WHO, the World Health Organization says about 421,000 people have been envenomed every year, about 20,000 deaths. This is really hard to put a number on because a lot of governments do not mandate people um, reporting um, envenomations or even deaths from venomous snakes. So it could be as high as 1.84 million people have been envenomed by an animal with almost up to 100,000 deaths. So, um, and this statistic is about five years old. Um, so it could be very higher. Um, most snake bite and venomings are in Africa, uh, Latin America, and Asia, which makes sense because they don't have a ton of healthcare systems or they're very rural in those areas. So it's harder to get to um, areas. And also there's more venomous snakes in those areas as well. All right, um, here's another mammal that we do have in Nebraska, the nor Northern Short-Tail Shrew. Um, it kind of looks like a little mouse, but it's very different. Um, these guys have a really long, engated um, snout. They have very tiny little eyes. They're kind of like these cute little animals, um, but their bottom incisors in the mouse, um, or sorry, in the mouth, they feature this groove, which allows for easier transmission of venom into the prey as it's being bitten. So um, basically these animals have venom to either kill or paralyze their prey so that they can eat it. Um, shrews are like the Tyrannosaurus rexes of the underground world. They are constantly eating and constantly looking for food. They have a very high metabolism, um, so they have to constantly eat. Um, some scientists believe that depending on some of the species of shrews, they have enough venom to dispatch of about 200 mice. That seems a little high, but I did want to put it in there. Um, but these animals do have, or they practice something called live hoarding. So they will bite something um, enough to kind of paralyze their prey. Um, so in times of plenty, when there's lots of food around, they will cache that food or store that food. Um, and they say that a fresh earthworm that has been bitten can stay crunchy and still contain all the nutrients that shrew would need to eat for up to 15 days with the venom or the saliva inside. Um, so shrew saliva also contains this protein digesting substance, and it helps break down muscle tissue, which makes it easier for the animal to eat their food. Um, so we're talking about small mice. They eat a lot of grasshoppers, a lot of crickets, bugs, that kind of thing. So, um, but basically it helps break down that muscle tissue so that they can eat it. All right. Stinging nettles are one. So plants with these pointed leaves, I'm sure lots of us have felt the horrible pain of stinging nettles, um, but they have these very fine hairs on them, on the leaves. They're very irritating. They have this special compound. Technically they're venomous um, plants because those hairs will go into and inject the, um, uh, toxin into your skin. So the hairs are fine when you rush up against them or brush up against them. Um, it could be up to a few minutes or it could be right away. You will feel this like horrible sensation in your hand or your leg. Um, those are those little hairs that have been released into your skin. Um, when you touch the plant, they function like hypodermic needles. So they hurt a lot. Um, but the um, they will inject venom underneath the skin when you brush up on them. All right. There are some animals that have venom resistance. So it's not all just a free for all. I have venom. You don't. Ha ha ha. So some animals are frequently at risk from venom and poisoning uh, that they've developed uh, basically a total resistance to them. A lot of animals in the mongoose family. So meerkats, mongoose, um, honey badgers, um, they have a special resistance because they're eating a lot of these foods that could be venomous. So um, over time, they've developed this uh, venom resistant mechanism to stop the binding of this venom them to their chemical receptor. So um, they can get bit and really nothing ever happens to them. Um, so uh, this can be endure, uh, into the bloodstream, but these animals, uh, it just doesn't take hold for them. So they have a lot of venom resistance. Um, they can hunt and eat venomous animals with very little risk. Um, venomous creatures, when you kind of get down to it, they're wimpy. They have one pointy end and they have one takeaway as their magical weapon of venom. Um, if you take that away, they don't really have anything else. So um, immunity can kind of prevent these animals um, from getting hurt when they eat. Um, uh, snakes also have venom immunity because if you think about it, if they strike and they accidentally bite themselves, they basically don't inadvertently uh, die from their strike. So they have certain types of venom resistance so that they don't die from themselves. 
All right. So that was a lot um, for venom. So I have a little bit for poison, but um, let's go ahead and move on to poisonous organisms. Um, so poison, if we learned earlier, you remember it's different than venom in how that is delivered. So poison has very small chemicals that are easily passive through the skin. So you breathe them, you touch them, or you eat them. Um, but in most cases, it's absorbed through the mouth, the mouth and the digestive system. Um, many poisonous organisms don't actually manufacture their own defenses. So they get them from other places. So a lot of people have heard of poison dart frogs. Um, they don't make their own poison. They eat certain types of ants and then manufacture their poison from those ants. So if you go to Petco and you buy a poison dart frog, and I would not recommend this, but if you lick it, nothing's gonna happen because they're not being fed those certain types of ants or their prey from the wild and they don't manufacture those poisons. So you can have a poison dart frog, poison arrow frog, nothing's gonna happen to you. Um, so that poison then is solely used for defense. Um, there's a lot of different variations, but there are two alternative strategies on how they manufacture that poison. Um, one of them is called biosynthesis. So this is the animal does produce their toxin. Some of them do do this and they have a specialized poison gland in their body. And then another one is called sequestration where they take toxins derived from an environmental source. So like those ants, or they eat certain type of leaf that is poisonous in their body and then they make it that way. All right, toads are one of them that are poisonous. We do have toads in Nebraska. Um, nothing's gonna happen to you, but if you've ever watched like a dog or a cat bite down on a toad, they probably drop it because that milky secretion from those paratoid glands on the back of their body, um, kind of up by their head, they just taste bad. And sometimes they kind of foam at the mouth. Nothing's really gonna happen to you in Nebraska if you touch or um, your animal bites a toad. Um, there's really two that have higher toxicity than others. That's the Colorado river toad, which we do not have. And then the cane toad, which is found in lots of places. It's a highly invasive toad um, that was introduced to Australia and then it's kind of gone everywhere. They're very large um, and they have very large paratoid glands and they have a little bit higher toxicity um, of what's called a bufotoxin um, that's present in a lot of different types of amphibians. Um, but what's in this chemical poison? Basically it's serotonin, it's hallucinogens, there's a vasoconstrictor. Um, basically all this stuff affects the heart. Um, certain people, um, 70s, 60s, 70s, uh, started licking toads as a way to kind of simulate the drug LSD. So a lot of uh, scientists have said that if you would lick a toad, um, please don't do this. If you would like lick a toad um, in certain areas, the chemical response to your body would be very similar to if you took LSD. So that is how high, that's why those all those hallucinogens in there, those serotonins, those vasoconstrictors, um, all of those different things mimic that response. All right, monarch butterflies are one. So um, it just kind of depends on the caterpillars of these animals, but how much um, the caterpillar eat or the potency of the milkweed that those caterpillars consume, um, that will depend on the potency of the monarch butterfly as an adult. So um, some milkweeds have higher levels of um, what's called cardiac glycoside glycosides inside of them. Um, so the more that they eat, um, when they turn into a butterfly, they will have those special toxins. So many animals, if you've noticed, um, are very colorful that are poisonous. So lots of um, poison dart frogs, these pretty um, monarch butterflies here. It's kind of a warning. So it's letting other animals know that they taste bad, they're poisonous, don't eat me. A lot of other animals have kind of learned to mimic that over time as well. There's something called a viceroy butterfly and a monarch butterfly. They look very similar together. There's only like one difference on the wing venation. Um, so telling the difference, if you're a cat, you have no idea what the difference is. Um, so you just kind of know, okay, I know that I don't want to eat that. So, um, but monarch butterflies are one of those are, that are considered a poisonous or really bitter tasting animal to eat. All right, poison ivy is one that I'm sure we've all been a part of. Um, it's a very common poisonous plant. You brush up against it, the oils get on your skin and it produces a very itchy skin rash. It takes a very small amount, um, but it produces this special sap um, that contains something called urethral. Um, and what happens is that gets on your skin, you touch it, you move it around your body and it contains a very um, potent toxic 
poison that makes you itch. Um, very small amount um, is only needed. It's about the size of a grain of salt um, is enough to cause a reaction in some people. And then it depends on the sensitivity of people, but sometimes it could take days or hours to actually have that chemical make a um, rash or develop on your skin. Um, also, if your dog brushes up against it and then you touch your dog, that could be a way to get it. You don't necessarily have to touch the plant itself, um, just something that's been in contact with that oil. Um, basically, it's a form of contact dermatitis is what happens when you brush up against it. All right, there's blister beetles. So different types of blister beetles, these little uh, beetles, basically it's a response to danger. They excrete this toxic poison. Um, it's a fluid um, through their leg joints. So different types of blister beetles have different types of toxicity, um, but the chemicals that they eat, they're, um, or the chemical that would get on you, they're colorless, they're odorless. It's like this fatty fluid um, and it causes blisters upon contact, hence the name blister beetle. Um, so when the contact gets your skin, it burns and it blisters usually immediately and or sometimes it, depending on the person, it can be delayed. Um, I can't remember the the name of the problem, but this is, happens a lot with horses. So this actually can cause um, fatalities in horses. Sometimes these beetles get pushed up um, when people are hanging and they get mixed in with those and then the uh, horses will eat them and it can actually cause horses to die because of these blister beetles. So um, if someone or a person or an animal, um, you're going to have swelling of the lips, mouth and throat. Sometimes you have trouble swallowing. There's abdominal pain, vomiting, blood in your urine, not fun things. All right. This is one, it's not super poisonous, but this family is known for not being the, the nicest plant. I'm sure a lot of you have these in your garden, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers. Um, if any of you have had tobacco products, they're all in the same uh, family. They're the nightshade family. Um, so they're very unique because they contain small amounts of what are called alkaloids. Um, there is a special species in this family. It's called deadly nightshade. The entire plant is poisonous. So there's a special chemical called atropine. It causes rapid heartbeat, sometimes confusion, hallucination, seizures. Um, it's pretty uh, sensitive stuff, um, but the chemicals are found in all parts of the plants. Um, they have to contain nitrogen to affect the human body, which many of the nightshade families do, um, but morphine, um, and then there's also quinine, I think is how you say it. Um, there are two examples of these plant-based medicines that contain alkaloids. So I'm not telling you that if you go to pick your tomatoes, you're going to get poisoned. There are certain um, people that are affected by them. I know a lot of people can't eat something that comes from the nightshade family. So potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, um, it affects people certain ways, but deadly nightshade, for example, is one, the entire plant is poisonous if you would eat it. So um, don't eat nightshade plants. Um, sometimes what they have done, this um, atropine chemical, um, sometimes they have scientists and pharmaceutical companies have added it to highly addictive painkillers to make the taste so bad that people do not get addicted to painkillers. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing that they've used over time to, with uh, plants. All right, and there's kind of one more category. So there's venomous, there's poisonous. Well, what about this one about like, Fitting cobras is a good, like, where do they fit in? They're not injecting, you're not eating it. Where does this fall in? So scientists in about 2013, there's a publication in something called the Journal of Biological Reviews. They proposed a third category of natural toxins known as toxigens. Uh, so this is a special category for only certain types of organisms, um, but these organisms don't inject their toxins with fangs or stingers, but they also don't wait to be touched or like mouthed either, or like bitten into. Um, so basically what they will do is they fling or spray their toxins on their attackers. Um, but also like cobras, they are also venomous. So not only can they spray you, certain species can spray, but they can also bite as well. Um, this also includes things like bombardier beetles, if you've heard of those before. Um, basically what happens is if you touch them or if they get threatened, they like expel this dust-like chemical um, that can be toxic for a lot of people. Um, salamanders, some species of salamanders will do this, and then also spitting cobras in here too. So um, there's kind of, I wanted to add this one kind of last topic or last uh, category because I thought it was interesting because it doesn't really fit 
hit on anything. So I think that's it. Okay. So that was a lot. <laughs> Sorry for all the, um, it is science of, so really getting into the nitty gritty of venomous versus poisonous animals and what this all means. Um, we will be back in January. So if you enjoyed this, if you've enjoyed the series this year, thank you for watching. Um, we will be coming back in January with some new topics. Um, if you also enjoyed this, please feel free to look up our YouTube channel. We have a ton of different educational videos on there. We do have a lot of science of, I think I looked the other day, there's like 60 or 70 some videos. So odds are, if you find a topic that you really want, there might already be a science of on it. If there's not, please fill out the registration and the evaluation that I'm going to send you here in a little bit. Um, fill that out so that I can get ideas for next year um, and I can focus on things that people actually want to hear about. So um, please check out our social media. You can find all the information about science of, some cool facts, what's happening in Nebraska and events um, on our Facebook and our social media. And then also Nebraska Wildlife Education website. We have lots of cool, free, downloadable things that you can use, educator resources, PowerPoints, downloadable activities, that kind of stuff. All right. Thanks, everyone. We will see you next year. Uh, I'm going to check the chat. There's quite a few things. So I do want to check here. What do we got? Hopefully I can answer these questions. Um, let's go all the way back to the beginning here. Okay, someone asked what that animal is. It's a platypus. Um, so they're not poisonous. They would be venomous uh, as an example. They have those little spurs on them. Um, apparently can't touch my screen. Um, someone asked, vipers and coral snakes are in the venomous snakes in the U.S.? Yeah, so there are coral snakes. They're in that Elapidae family. Um, and then the vipers are like the rattlesnakes that we have here in Nebraska. Yes. Um, Thank you. We don't have any in the UK. Good for you. Um, adders found in the UK and is venomous. Yes. Um, I know adders are a big thing. We saw a ton of them when we went to Africa. Very, very cool. But yes, something to absolutely say, just be cautious of. Um, can an animal be both venomous and poisonous? Yes, absolutely. There are a few species. There's a species of snake actually called the tiger keelback. Um, I can't remember if it's in Africa or uh, South America, but they are both poisonous and venomous. There are species that both can be poisonous and venomous. So if an animal would eat it, they would get those effects, but also it can bite and they would have those effects as well. Good question. Um, are female black widows more venomous than males or no difference? Good question, Anna. Um, I, I don't know. I see someone posted a, a thing on here. Okay, thank you. Someone uh, helped me out. So they have larger, longer fangs, body sizes larger. They have more prominent venomous glands. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that helping me out. You're like my own special moderator. So thank you. Um, what is the worst season to be stung by a bee? Thank you. I appreciate you, Tuck Up. Thank you so much. You're doing a great job moderating. You should be on the payroll here. Um, can a snake use all the venom or is it continuously produced? Good question. Yeah, it takes time to replenish it. Um, that's why they do want to use it sparingly. Absolutely. So when we talked earlier about venom being very expensive for them to manufacture, um, they don't want to be caught without venom. It's like their last resort, but if they have to use it, they absolutely will. But yes, it does take a while sometimes to um, replenish that. So thank you. Um, I love science. Thank you. Um, what are the most common venomous and poisonous animals? Absolutely depends on where you are at. Um, if I'm going to go within Nebraska, um, I mean, spiders are cont cont uh, technically considered venomous, but not to people. Um, poison ivy is something that a lot of people have issues with. So it kind of just depends on where you are at. Um are tarantulas venomous even though they are kept as pets? Technically, yes, all tarantulas are venomous, um, but not all of them have the same type of potency. Um, there are some that you absolutely do not want to touch. Um, some of them, some tarantula species, I don't know which one, not only are they venomous with their chelicerae and their venom uh, glands, but they also have these things called urticating hairs, um, and they will flick them one of the girls in my office was telling us about this. She worked at the zoo one time and she had to, um, 
was with someone that had a tarantula out and all of a sudden the tarantula got spooked and it flung its hairs and she got them in her neck and it she said it kind of felt like uh nettles being in her neck so um not only could they bite but they do have those flicking hairs and it's just very painful it's very skin irritation the thing is you have to pull them out as well but they're very fine hair so um yes people keep them as pets but they are venomous um venomous animals have actually been on the rise for people having them as pets there's a whole group of venomous breeders um, and a lot of people that have venomous snakes as pets. Um, I know quite a few of them. Some of them are illegal to have. So just make sure you check your city limitations. Um, Omaha and Lincoln in Nebraska have very strict limitations on some, but mostly with a lot of snakes, there's there's nothing. So if you live in like Old Oil in Nebraska, you could have an eyelash viper and no one's going to tell you that that's wrong. Please don't do that, but it's technically not wrong. Um, Thank you, Monica. These are great. Thank you. I can't wait to see everyone again. Thank you. Information was cool. Good. I hope everyone had some good information um, and now knows the difference between poisonous and venomous. Uh, so make sure you use those correctly and absolutely correct people if they say it wrong. So thank you so much. Um, we will see you all in January. I think January 11th will be the next one. So um, please keep an eye on your updates, on your emails, the listservs, um, Game and Parks press releases, that kind of stuff. So thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of 2023 and we will see you in 2024. So thanks everyone. Have a great year, rest of your year. Thank you. Bye.